everyone, how are you? I hope you're okay. And um, as I promised, we are gonna start talking about LLMs. No, generative AI all around us. So basically, in the last few months, more or less, I started working on a project that is called Stable YOLO. And I work with uh, several co authors. You can see a lot of them here. So basically, uh, the, the, this is a paper that we, we recently presented that is called Stable YOLO Optimizing Image Generation for Large Language Models. And you can see that we are many, many, many people. So it was a collaboration between my colleagues from King's College London with other colleagues from UCL. So the idea of this collaboration was to create a system that is able to improve the generation process of image generation through a stable diffusion. So you can imagine that uh, this is about generative AI. And I know this is a topic that everyone is talking about. Everyone is putting videos about generative AI, about how they work, etc. I said, I want to do that also just, you know, to be a little bit more on the brand, but just for you. And just in case you want to understand a little bit more about generative AI, basically generative AI is now coping the market and is basically a system that can generate images, music, text, well, it can do a lot of things, videos, and basically it works with prompts. So you just provide a description of what you want to provide and the generative system is going to generate back what the system really wants to, to give you back because it might be connected to your prompt but it might not be connected to your prompt. That's something that is called hallucinations. That basically is something that the generative model is doing. So there are many, many, many ethical concerns about generative AI, about copyright, etc. Et I'm not going to go through that path. We can go through that path in another video. I'm very, very critic. Thank God you're not listening to my videos in Spanish if you're listening to this one in English. But just to let you know, this is going to be about how to improve generative AI automatically, which might not be that good, but here we are. Okay, so let's start with the first problem of generative AI, that is the non-deterministic problem. Okay, so imagine that you are just talking with your stable diffusion model that is going to create an image and you are going to provide the following description. I want a burger falling in pieces, juicy, testy, hot, promotional photo, intricate details, HDR, God knows what that means, cinematic, Adobe Lightroom, highly detailed. Okay, and you just give that to your generative AI model for some reason, if not what you mean, because it's going to provide four different images of burgers. Surprise, surprise, all of them has cheese but they are slightly different. This is because this prompt was properly engineered, but in different cases, it might happen that the prompt might be vague enough to provide different images in different contexts. So for example, imagine that the first one is black and white, the second one is an illustration, the third one is photorealistic, and the last one is a Picasso. So this might happen, this might happen because you never know when the generative AI is going to start, and it has a creative component, which is good. But at the same time, it's something that we want to control because sometimes we want to provide a specific context and we want to understand how to provide that specific context. Okay, good. So let's talk about prompt engineering and parameters. So basically, imagine that you start with a specific prompt, as I said before, Donald Trump singing in a karaoke. So here you have the first image, which is uh, Donald Trump uh, with his mouth open, quite a singing. So, or, or maybe trying to eat the, the, the previous hamburger. Actually, you have multiple Donald Trumps, you have a black and white image. So it's like, okay, this is quite of an illustration. I want something a bit more photorealistic. So once you say that, you see an image that is more colorful, is slightly more photorealistic in terms of the people who are surrounding Donald Trump. All of them look that are either gonna eat Donald Trump or sing with Donald Trump, it's not very clear. Um, but this has, you know, like a slight taste of photorealism. Not a good one, but then, we say, okay, let's add a little bit more. I want the image in AK and look into a photo shoot. So now you have Donald Trump that looks like Frank Sinatra. And basically this image, I think, has quite a good quality in general. But then we are going to play with the parameters of the AI. Okay, we're going to play with one of the parameters that is called the guidance scale. The guidance scale is something like the temperature of the AI. So what we are going to do is to put the guidance scales to 20 and see what happens. So basically, the image is more imaginative now. 
So it's losing a little bit of the photorealistic context, even though it's still Donald Trump in some colors, and it's putting in a bit more of imaginative context. So basically, we are in a karaoke, no? so it just puts some lights around, it just, you know, give it a little more vibrant to the image, but it might not be that good. So there's something that we need to find here, which is that, um, that uh, my, my, one of my friends call it cold deluxe, which is not too hot, not too cold. And basically what we want to do is to identify the best parameters to create, for instance, in this case, a photorealistic image. Okay, so the main question that we have is how can we tune these specific systems? So now is when we went to the SSBSC Talent Strat. So basically we start working with some of our colleagues from UCL. They organize a workshop at UCL. By the way, if you are a researcher and you are interested in search based software engineering tracks, it might be good that you pay attention in June, July, August to this workshop that they organize because they try to organize it every year and they're very, very good papers that has been coming from these workshops. So we just went there, we start having some ideas, we actually submit, I think, like three papers, two were accepted, one was rejected and it was a lot of fun just to work together. So basically that's where this paper come from. And now what we did is to take a specific generative AI to improve, which was the first step. Which one we took? A stable diffusion. A stable diffusion is a generative AI that you can find in Hugging Face. It's actually quite popular at the moment with Midjourney or Dali. And basically, one of the main advantages is that it's open for everyone to use at the moment with restrictions. So basically, you can just go to Hugging Face and you can use it for these uh, research purposes. Okay? And the specific one that we use for these experiments, even though I will mention it later, is Stable Diffusion 2.1. So, what do we have to improve in, in this specific model? So we just start analyzing the specific parameters of the model. So basically, we have the prompt, which is one of the things that we want to improve. But a part of the prompt, we have other parameters. We have the inference steps. The inference steps is how much the system is iterating the image in order to produ produce a better image, okay, to improve the quality. But that's not necessarily true because a lot of the iterations, I mean, having a lot of iterations might produce a worse image. So, who knows? Then you have the guidance scale. As I said, something like the temperature of the model. More imaginative, more concrete, but actually the guidance scale is very low. You're going to have like a kind of sketch, so it's not very useful. And if it's very high, you're going to have Donald Trump in very light so not, not very high not, 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 not very fun either so you also need to find like the point in the middle where you're going to be there's something that I didn't know that exists until I start working with stable diffusion which is the negative prompt so you can also provide a prompt of the things that you don't want so it's like uh, in Google when you put the minus and you say okay I don't want to find this so you can do the same in the prompt so you are creating a photorealistic image Maybe you don't want to have a painting, you don't want to have a black and white, well, maybe you want to have a black and white, sorry. Maybe you don't want to have a painting, maybe you don't want to have a drawing, maybe you don't want to have an illustration, so these are options for your negative prompt, okay? And one of the things that is important is the seed. The seed is basically the starting point for the generation process. So if you control the starting point, you can generate e images that are similar or at least with the same base in different contexts, which is basically what DALI normally use when you say, okay, I want to iterate through this image, okay? Now, we want to do it automatically. We want to apply the search component. And for that, what we're going to have is a search algorithm. So in the search algorithm, what we need to define first is the algorithm that we are going to use. In this case, we are going to use a simple search algorithm. We need to define a fitness function. So how do we find the quality of the image? We are going to talk about this in a bit, okay? We need to define encoding of the individuals. So each individual for us is going to be a set of parameters, a prompt and a negative prompt. Okay, that's going to be the individual and we are going to evaluate, so basically what would be a configuration, we are going to evaluate that specific prompt in the system. Okay, and finally we are going to have objectives of improvement, in the case objectives are going to be the different objects that are created in image, that is what we want to improve, the quality that we want to increase. Okay, so we are going to work with photorealistic images. Why is that? Because we know that there are systems that are able to see and there are visualization systems that can identify objects in image. Actually, the one that we are going to use is called YOLO. 
and they are going to provide the quality of the identification process. So the clearer the object is for the system, the better for our actual generation process. Okay? So basically, so what's YOLO? So YOLO is a system that is going to identify objects in images. Okay, and it can do it in different ways. So, for example, it can classify objects. So you just give it an image and it says, okay, I have this object, this object, and this object that you have in the left side. It can detect the specifics of the object in the image. So, for example, it can say, okay, I'm detecting a person here with 50% probability and detecting a dog here with 40% probability. We're not going to work with people, okay, just to avoid fairness issues, but we are going to go with animals and objects in this world, just like a small disclosure. It can segment images, okay, which is very useful. It can also track images. So, for example, you can track cars, you can track people, which is not very legal, and you can also identify the pose of a person using YOLO. In our case, we are only going to focus on the detection, and we are going to focus on the percentage of detection to measure the quality of the generation process. So, for that, we create a stable YOLO. So, a stable YOLO is going to have three components. It's going to have a stable diffusion, it's going to have YOLO, obviously, and it's going to have a search component that is going to try to improve a stable diffusion with the information provided by YOLO. How this is going to work? A stable diffusion is going to generate an image. So, for example, this beautiful uh, forest that we have in front of us. Then the image is going to be taken by YOLO, and YOLO is going to provide a percentage of its object, of the quality of its object that is recognizing. So, for example, I see a dog. I say, oh, I can see a dog with 40% of probability. Why is that? Because maybe it's not a dog, maybe it's a goat. Or I can see an apple with 90% of probability. Oh, so it's likely to be an apple. Yeah, very likely. So then I'm going to give it to my evolutionary algorithm, and the evolutionary algorithm is going to start the search process. Okay? It's going to generate a population, it's going to have different configuration, and using these specific objects, it's going to construct the fitness. The fitness is going to combine all of the objects as objectives, but because we have different number of objects, different times in different images, we cannot have a fitness that varies through multiple objects that much. So we are going to combine them in a single fitness and we are going to put the average of the quality of the image. And that's going to be the outcome of the algorithm. It's going to provide new configurations until it finds images with a very, very good quality. Okay? So, now we go to the evaluation, the most important part. So, is this actually, first question, is this actually worthy? Are we actually improving the quality of the images? Because we have the non-deterministic component, we are maybe having many outputs, it's non -de 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 there are many things that can go wrong. So, is this really improving or we are just generating more noise with no direction? So, the second question is, okay, what happened with the parameters? So if we are improving, which, has, which one are the best parameters? Which prom length might be better? Which negative prom might be better? Okay, a little bit of everything. When the algorithm is converging, these things. Last but not least, okay, if you are improving, there are going to be a strong connection with the prom. So which keywords are more recommended in this specific context of image generation for photorealistic images? This is something that you can just analyze to any other objective. So you can do it with drawing, etc. Et as long as you have something that can provide you some feedback, okay? So then, we just put the experimental setup, we use Stable Diffusion 2 and YOLO 8, we use uh, 44 different, 42 different topics, many of them are animals, objects, etc. Then, for the genetic algorithm, because we have a strong cost for generating images, you can imagine we can generate, I think, about uh, three, four images per minute, so we need to put a low number of generation individuals per generation, but still a reasonable one to create an improvement. We just put an 0.2 mutation and crossover. We repeated experiments four times because, as I said, there is a strong cost on the uh, generation process. And we also have a, an operating system, Ubuntu 20 with 36 CPUs, 256 gigas of RAM, and an NVIDIA Titan V of 12 gigabytes. Okay? So, you can see that you have high specs for the graphics. It's not something that you can do easily, even in this case, it's slow. If you just use a CPU, it will be slower. Okay, so let's see what happened with the results. So, first question, are we actually improving? Is this actually worth it? 
The answer is yes. Yes, thank God we are. So basically, we can see that we are always improving the results with all of the different objects that we are pumping. And the improvement is significant, statistically significant. So basically, you can see actually in the right side that the quality of the images after applying stable YOLO is higher than the quality of the images before. Okay, and that's something that is very good because we can actually use this system to improve generative AI in general. So then, in terms of the parameters, you can see, for example, that the guidance scale is about 9. So actually, this parameter goes between 2 and 20. So it's good to know that somewhere in the middle is at the best parameters. In terms of the number of inference steps, it's about 45, which is quite good because if you put 100, it takes even longer to generate the images. So it's, and it was the maximum of the search. So having 45 is quite good because it saves time, it saves resources. Okay, it's greener. Then, if you want to check the prompt length for the positive prompt, we discovered that with about six, seven keywords, it was enough. So you don't need to put a prompt that is like some people are putting on the internet, like a lot of words, or sometimes words are meaningless for the system. In terms of the negative prompt, with four or five words should be enough, which is also good, so you don't need to put a negative prompt that is never ending. In terms of convergence, the algorithm was able to converge in generation 45, which is also good, but still very close to the end of the generation, so maybe more generation might, be, might, might help to create even better images. And in terms of scalability, our system is able to scale linearly in terms of the number of GPUs. So that's something that might be helpful if we want to scale this to make something even more sophisticated. Okay. Finally, which words are more relevant? So this is quite interesting because this is something non-intuitive. With the negative prompts, it's more intuitive because the words that are more relevant in terms of the, of the words that you don't want to appear are illustration, drawing, sketch, crop, for some reason, art, etc. So obviously it's photorealistic, so you don't want to have all of this. But once we go to the photorealistic one, uh, you have the most obvious one, which is photograph, but then you have others that are not so intuitive, like the depth of the field, 100 millimeters. You have blended visuals. You have the name of a specific camera, like Kodak Portra 800. I have no clue where that comes from. You have obviously color, overlapping compositions, and ultra real, which are more make more sense. Okay, but others might not be so intuitive. So it's something that you might want to explore before you start generating photorealistic images. So you have a better prompt, and with a better prompt, you are likely to generate better images or clearer images for your system. Okay? So just like a small point of discussion, one of the good things about this work is that we are showing how generative AI can support each other and, and, and each other learning. So basically, this is very good because you can automatically improve the quality of an AI system with another AI without human intervention, without having the human in the loop. And that's going to be very helpful in the future to improve the quality of AI without us. Okay? So how do we do that? How we can do that in general? By using search. And that's the main conclusion of this work. That's how we want to generalize the work. Finding combinations of AIs that can improve each other by search. So just to conclude, generative AI is all around us, so basically we just want to work on improving it. And how we do that with prompting engineering and parameters. But because we want to do that automatically, we created a stable YOLO. That is basically a first step of improving generative AI in general. And basically we discovered that the system is able to improve the generation of images in all of the cases. So thank you very much for your time. I hope you liked the video. Please. Follow me on Twitter if you are not doing that so. Also, if you want to subscribe to the channel, just like the video and you also have my information there. So thank you very much. I promise to do videos about um, stable diffusion and about YOLO, videos about the tools, how to use the tools. So if you want to leave some requests in the comments, just let me know and I'm more than happy to listen it. And if I can do it, I will be able to, uh, if I'm able to do it, I will try to do a video. Okay. Thank you very much and see you soon. Bye bye.